You're seeing a replica of the Apollo capsule, because Bitcoin literally went to the moon since we did our first film, Bitcoin, the end of money as we know it. That was in 2014-15, and our film also went ballistic. It was pirated on BitTorrent, on YouTube, and of course also legally licensed on many TV channels. And since then we also did another film called Cryptopia, Bitcoin, Blockchains and the Future of the Internet about the whole industry that was evolving slowly in 2018-19. Many have requested an updated and upgraded version of the end of money. That's why we're here. Let's jump right in and I'll be right back. Look closely. What do we all have in common? No matter what corner of the world you live in, you need food, water, shelter, and money. Half of every transaction involves money in exchange for goods or services, stocks, a loaf of bread, illegal drugs. You gotta pay for it. We spend much of our lives chasing money to make a living and accomplish our dreams. But it's also an instrument of destruction, some might say evil, driving criminals to lie, steal, and even murder. The existing banking system extracts enormous value from society and it is parasitic in nature. Money is a catalyst for the worst and the best of human endeavor. Before civilization, we created currency, fuel for wars, the path to power, champion and enemy of innovation. Money is so integral to our society and our global economy that its true nature remains a mystery to most. This is the story of money, perhaps the end of money as we know it. No matter how fat your bank account or how thin your wallet, to us it's all cold hard cash. There are some who want to kill it, get rid of it, burn your dollars, your euros, your yen and transform every penny you have into ones and zeros. Digital currency, entrust it to the web and computers spread across the planet. Magic internet money, it's called cryptocurrency, Bitcoin. Invented in secret, it was a gift to the world. It's not just a currency, but it's actually programmable money. A potential curse on bankers. I and mean, there's nothing that the, the big banks or politicians can do to stop it breaking every government's grip on money supply. What the internet did for information, Bitcoin is doing for money. Could it be the new gold? Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, you have to really stretch your uh, imagination to infer what the intrinsic value of Bitcoin is. Regulators, the Federal Reserve, the banking system, at least understand this is a thing that they have to take seriously. This is going to change the economic culture. Bitcoin could be a microeconomic miracle worker and it could be a macroeconomic wrecking ball. Is Bitcoin the currency of the future? A godsend for criminals? Or a recipe for financial disaster? If you trust your money just as it is, we have a little story to share. This documentary was originally voiced by John Barrett of the Bitcoins and Gravy podcast. So when you see me or hear me, I'm updating the script, giving you better context or fixing stuff that we got wrong. Okay, on with the show. Once upon a time, there was a big party with everyone standing around the punch bowl, drunk. Politicians credited the strong economy to their wise decisions. Businesses jumped into new profitable markets, ignoring risk. In fact, the experts said there was no risk. Then, troubling market data from minor countries spooked the markets. Rumors spread. More bad news rattled housing prices at the heart of the financial world. A major bank went insolvent. Investors and businesses made a run on the other banks, demanding their cash deposits. The largest financial institutions in the center of the modern world were frozen. Assets were seized, banks foreclosed. A credit crunch threatened the entire world economy. And then, finally, the government stepped in. The largest bank bailout ever. Swift action by the head of state had saved the day. Remember that? No, you don't. It happened 2,000 years ago. 
Rome, 33 AD. Ground zero for the first recorded liquidity crisis and government bailout in history. The largest empire the world had ever seen was brought to its knees by a banking disaster. Emperor Tiberius used money from the national treasury to bail out the country's troubled banks and companies. History may not repeat itself, but it certainly rhymes. Badly. People in power and their money have always been at the very center of it. The story of money is as old as civilization itself. When we lived in small tribes, keeping track of debt was easy. You owed somebody a load of firewood. A neighbor owed you a piece of meat. Credits and debits were kept in your head, a mental ledger. Currency is a language that allows us to express transactional value between people. It's a technology that's older than uh, the wheel. It's as old as fire. When humans wanted to trade outside their tribe or village, they needed something everyone could agree had value, something scalable. Enter commodity monies. There were many kinds, but each had to embody the same five characteristics. A commodity money is relatively scarce, easily recognizable, can be cut into smaller pieces. You can substitute one piece for another of equal value, and you can carry it around without too much trouble. In ancient Rome, it was salt. The Aztecs used cacao beans. It was whale teeth on Fiji yak dung in Tibet, shells in Africa and China. Grains, metal, ivory, rare stones, leather, fish. If it had the five characteristics of commodity money, someone probably used it as currency. And then you ask, what value do these currencies have? If you go into a primary school, you'll see children exchanging rubber bands and Tamagotchi and Pokemon cards and baseball cards and sweets and candy and any other form of currency. People invent currency when they have no other currency. And now they're going to invent digital currencies. But commodities that aren't durable are a lousy store of value. A bad cacao crop or a huge new salt discovery can throw your currency and economy into turmoil. A more stable system was needed. About 2,500 years ago, the first metal coins were minted in China and in what is now Turkey. These coins shared the same five characteristics with commodity money, but were also very durable. In some cases, coins are the only thing left of entire civilizations. Money does not originate with governments. Money arises naturally as markets uh, begin to develop and as people with the division of labor realize that if I have eggs and you have a cow, we may need some medium of exchange in order for you to buy my eggs or for me to buy your cow. Coins were an objective and universal unit of account and they allowed people to buy and sell goods over vast regions. The market economy was born coins worked, but only if people trusted that the king or emperor who issued them wasn't cheating on the metal content. Using coins also meant that an authority now controlled the supply of your currency. Money and political power were inextricably linked, centralized. Yeah, so I wish we made this point a little bit clearer. You see, the main issue here is once somebody is in control of that money supply, that introduces the potential for corrupting the system. It doesn't matter whether they wear a crown or a suit. Minting coins in a steady and predictable manner allowed economic growth and stability. The Wushu coin in China retained its value for 500 years. In Constantinople, the Solidus lasted for 700 years. But in those times, the coins didn't have the, the milled this sort of milled edge, they were flat. And uh, what used to happen was, as coins were passing from people to people, people would cut little bits off. And in fact, some of the taxation that the kings would do would actually be take one-eighth of the coin off. Taxes built castles, 
and financed military campaigns, expensive hobbies. Soon, royal mints were substituting cheaper metals for silver and gold. This is called debasement, and Europe's kings made a habit of it. The currency of France was debased every 20 months for 200 years. If no one can trust the gold or silver content of your coins, how can you trade with other countries? International merchants found a solution. They recognize that one person's debt has value. It can be traded or transferred. When those IOUs came from reputable sources, they could be used as a form of money, paper money. This money was not based on hard commodities or metal, but instead on someone's promise to pay. Merchant families like the Medici in 15th century Florence acted as clearinghouses for these IOUs. It worked like this. An English trader ordered a shipment of Italian cloth from the Medici for 100 gold coins. His promise to pay the Medici was put on paper. Meanwhile, the Medici owed 100 gold coins to another trading partner for delivery of wine from France. The parties didn't go to the expense of transporting and exchanging gold coins. Instead, the paper was transferred. Everyone agreed that the paper had value, 100 gold coins, but only because everyone trusted the Medici as solvent middlemen. They had created a paper money machine. Within a few generations, they rose from low crime to high finance. Their great wealth helped fuel the Italian Renaissance and elevated the family to levels of enormous political power, the power to marry into royal families and get elected as popes. The ties binding money to power, politics, and influence now ran through church and state. Merchants had proven that creating paper currency could be wildly profitable. Goldsmiths wanted in on the action. Imagine it like this. If the goldsmith had seen over a period of time that some of the coins he was storing for people were gathering dust, the people who owned them don't need them right now. So what if I go and lend them out into the community and I charge them interest on this loan? So he starts out lending some of these gold coins and then later, he realizes, actually, people don't even want the gold coins. They just want the piece of paper that says the, the, the gold coins are in the bank and with the goldsmith. So I can now make a loan with these pieces of paper. And whatever I write on a piece of paper, as long as people trust me, they'll trust the paper. And effectively, the, the goldsmiths and the early day bankers, they had literally acquired the power to print money. More and more, private paper money from merchants and banks circulated and began to rival the crown's coins. The power inherent in controlling and issuing money began slipping away from the rulers. They couldn't tax or debase this new kind of money, but they had bigger ambitions than ever with trading posts, colonies, and empires that now stretched across the globe. For centuries, European countries would take turns building massive fleets and waging war on each other to rule the world. Government wanted to take the people's money in order to finance its wars. That's essentially the history of money. Money and warfare go together. War is expensive. One year's income taxes simply aren't enough. Kings and queens had to borrow money against future taxes. They needed a groundbreaking financial innovation, government bonds. The loans came from rich merchant families and goldsmiths, who by now had become powerful financiers and bankers. Sovereign debt and deficit spending had been born. In 1694, the Bank of England was established to fund a war against France. England's central bank was privately owned and granted the monopoly to issue banknotes, paper that could be redeemed for an equal amount of gold from the government coffers. The central bank soon also managed the entire debt of the crown. 
money has been a tool of sovereignty for centuries. Being able to issue currency uh, gave you the power, but it also gave the value to that monetary supply by backing it with a force of state, with essentially the debt of state. When the U.S. won independence from Britain, the first article of the new constitution gave Congress the exclusive right to coin money. This currency's value was tied to gold in government vaults. From 1781 until the Panic of 1907, the financial system of the U.S. was an economic petri dish. Brief central banks, state banks, private banks, private currency, government currency, depressions, strong growth, recessions, regular boom and bust cycles. The long term, as far as capital is concerned, people want predictability. People want stability. From the back of that, they can plan. Now, it's very hard to plan in the long term with such a level of volatility. In 1913, bankers and politicians decided that it was in the country's best interest, and theirs, to have a permanent central bank. They created the Federal Reserve. Among its jobs, expand or contract the supply of a single national currency, the Federal Reserve Note. The dollar was tied to gold, and strategic control of it would avoid booms that lead to busts. At least that was the plan. Then came 1929. The Great Depression would have a profound effect on monetary policy worldwide. I shall ask the Congress for the one remaining instrument to meet the crisis. Broad executive power. Soon, the Fed had printed nearly all the money it legally could to pump life back into the economy. It needed gold to fire up the mint. So in 1933, President Roosevelt issued a controversial executive order, forcing all U.S. citizens to sell their gold to the Federal Reserve at a fixed price, or go to prison. After World War II, America became the global superpower, and with it, the US dollar emerged as the most important reserve currency in the world. Other countries pegged their currency to the dollar, which could still be redeemed for gold. In fact, the US owned more than half of the world's gold reserves. In the next few decades, more dollars flowed to foreign countries. Governments began debasing their coins with cheaper metals and printing more of their own currency than they had in gold. The bond between precious metals and paper currency was cracking. This is a 1966-50 cent piece. It was the last coin uh, in regular circulation in Australia to contain silver, and it contains 80% silver. So in 1966, this was 50 cents. Nowadays, it's eight dollars, roughly, in silver alone. By 1966, foreign nations had had enough of the U.S. collecting gold and printing cash. And they had more value in dollars than the U.S. had bullion in its vaults. They demanded gold in return for their paper dollars. Arguments about the value of the dollar versus their currency ensued. In 1971, President Nixon settled the matter. He severed United States currency from the gold standard. I have directed Secretary Connolly to suspend temporarily the convertibility of the dollar into gold or other reserve assets, except in amounts and conditions determined to be in the interest of monetary stability and in the best interest of the United States. Never again could anyone legally demand U.S. government gold in exchange for paper dollars. For better or worse, the dollar was now backed solely by the full faith and credit of the United States government. The wealthiest nation the world had ever known would bet its future on a single word, trust. 1971 really was a watershed moment when the world's reserve currency, and with it most of the world, lost its tether to gold. That was a really big deal. People have this mythology of money that is based on very little fact. Uh, and one of the nice things about Bitcoin is that it forces people to start to ask questions about the fundamentals of money. A 
Bitcoin is an attempt uh, to adopt the advanced computerized system that we have, the internet, to resurrecting what money used to be all about. I think our dollar policies, our monetary policies, our fiscal policies have absolutely created a, a, a nation of debtors. Not just personal debt, not just corporate debt, but government debt. I mean, you have to look at those all together as one big thing. What is the wealth of the nation? Well, the wealth of the nation is a gigantic hole of money that we owe to the rest of the world that is never going to be paid back. Today, the United States pays more than $400 billion in interest to its creditors every year. Hold on, hold on. Sorry for interrupting again, John. That was back in 2015, when the total debt of the United States government was around $18 trillion. Today, it's more like $29 trillion and growing by the day. Let's just hope interest rates stay low. When a government spends more money than it collects in taxes, it simply borrows more or it creates more. At one time, every piece of paper money was backed by gold. Remember, for every $20 bill, there was $20 worth of gold in a government vault. Not anymore. Today, governments create currency by first creating bonds or treasury bills. These bonds are sold in the market, generating funds for the government that issued them. Large banks buy U.S. bonds to flip them, selling them to the Federal Reserve at a profit. This is the magic money machine. You see, the Fed is America's central bank, but it doesn't have any money. No cash on its balance sheets. When a bank buys a bond and takes it to the Federal Reserve, the Fed simply says, thank you, Mr. Banker. Here's the principal and some profit. New money isn't exchanged. It simply appears on the bank's accounts. Magic. The Fed also sets the bar for how much interest you pay for a car, home, or business loan. The Federal Reserve has been given the impossible task of trying to run the credit and monetary system as though we are the Soviet Union. Um, it's the central planner for the, for the key aspect of capitalism, which is how money and credit is allocated. The Federal Reserve, on balance, uh, does not help the economy. On balance, it hurts the economy. And it's bound to make mistakes, even with the best of intentions. The Fed is also supposed to boost employment with low interest rates, encouraging people and businesses to buy more goods and services. Governments getting involved in money is a good thing, and it's also a bad thing. It's a good thing because money is the arteries of the economy, the blood supply of the economy. Markets are subject to bouts of euphoria and despair. And it makes sense for governments to back currency and manipulate it. Moving the money supply up and down is the most powerful way to sedate that boom and bust cycle. Manipulating the supply of money has short-term and long-term consequences. Central banks aim to create new money carefully, strategically, and very, very slowly. Releasing more money into the economy causes prices to rise, ideally by 2% every year. That's supposed to foster economic growth. But 2% inflation means the buying power of one cash dollar in your pocket today will be 98 cents next year, and less nearly every year to come. So, what does that mean? If you earned a dollar in 1913, you could buy 16 loaves of bread. Today, a dollar barely buys you one. Okay, time for another update. The official statistics say it's about $1.50 these days. But that depends on where you live, where you shop, and which numbers you trust. That's not a quaint notion of how cheap things used to be. 
It's proof that the value of your cash is slowly withering away. That one dollar invested at 2% in 1913 would now be worth $7.24, more than 600% return versus a near total loss. So the U.S. dollar has gone from being worth one dollar to now being worth about four cents. Uh, so that's, you know, 96% of its original value. And it's a direct result of government control. Well, these numbers would look way worse now with all these new trillions floating in the system. You see, the officials will deny that inflation is happening, and then maybe they will fudge the numbers, then they will say it's just temporary. But ultimately, what it means is that the money in your bank account is worth a little bit less every single day. And the thing is, we haven't even gotten to the crazy part of our financial system. Governments don't create money from thin air all alone. You play a key role in the magic money machine. It's not really the central banks that are the problem. I mean, they're part of the problem, but the real problem is that we've given the power to create money to the same banks that caused the financial crisis. We put our paychecks and savings into a bank account and draw from it as we need it. The banks are custodians of our money, right? Wrong. It is now the property of the bank on their balance sheets. They can do just about anything they want with it. For example, create new money. Here's how. Your bank account shows $100, but the bank only holds three and loans 97 to Bob to buy something. In the bank's computers, you still have $100 in your account, but Bob now has $97 of new virtual money in his account. Just digits on a computer screen. There's no cash, no gold, or anything else backing up the new numbers in Bob's account. Just his promise to pay it back. This is new money created as debt. When those $97 are spent, say in a shop, the shop owner deposits into another bank, and it is lent out again, and again, and again. And each of these people have numbers in their accounts showing that they own this money. So your original $100 has multiplied. Now there are over $3,300 in the system. This process of loaning out far more money than a bank actually has as cash on hand is called fractional reserve banking. In the UK, 97% of the money that exists is just numbers in the computer system, and those numbers are created by the banks. Banks earn untold billions in interest every year by creating and lending virtual money. What's more, banks don't even need your deposit to create new money. If they consider someone credit worthy for a loan, they can put new magic money into his or her account and start charging interest. So reporters talk about Bitcoin as though it's, a, as though it's the first digital currency. But actually we use digital currency every time you make a, a transaction through internet banking or through your, your bank card. It, actually it's not even just digital currency, it's digital currency that is created by the banks, essentially out of nothing. In other words, all new money is debt. In paychecks, bank accounts, 401ks, that loan to Bob, credit card debt, your home loan, all began life as virtual money created by the banks. The entire system is based on trust. Trust in the bank's solvency. Trust in the debtor's ability to repay their debt. If all bank customers demanded just 3% of their deposits right now in cash, this run on the banks would reveal the truth. Almost none of that paper currency you think is in your bank account exists. It never did. This seems pretty shaky, but believe it or not, as long as there's trust in the system, it actually works. And without our trust, well. Selling subprime loans and betting they will fail may not be sacred, but it is lucrative. As much as one quarter of our best and brightest are being lured by the siren call of the money machine. 
Instead of science, engineering, or medicine, they chose a career playing with, betting with, other people's money. To get rich quick, very rich. And sometimes they take shortcuts. Getting by on a nickel and a dime. My ancestors in Greece talked about the corrupting influence of power, and nothing has changed in these 3,000 years. When you give control over massive amounts of money to a few individuals, they will take advantage of that control. Banks today are factoring in fines and money laundering and all the rules that they break into their cost of doing business. JP Morgan is today coming out and saying that Bitcoin is uh, not a legitimate way of doing business. Banks today are tied into a system that is completely rigged to basically harvest money from the entire global economy and pump it into the hands of very few. Don't get consumed by The existing banking system is cozy, it's captured the regulators, it extracts enormous value from society without delivering anything in return, and it is parasitic in nature. The banks play a very pivotal role in an economy. You look at any successful economy, it has successful banks. There's a very close correlation with banking profits and the economy as a whole. In medieval Europe, a banker who couldn't repay depositors was hanged. Today, that same banker would get bailed out paid bonuses, and enjoy some tax benefits, too. Today's financial innovators package assets in ever more complex ways, slicing, dicing, securitizing, always using someone else's money. They sell debt, transfer risks, leverage bets. That's what they call innovation. History teaches that the most revolutionary and disruptive innovation nearly always comes from the fringe, not from corporate cubicles. True innovators see the world differently. They see the big picture, creating new products and entire systems that lead to new industries. Steve Jobs called them the square cogs in round holes. It's unsurprising that new innovations always come from a niche group of early adopters because it is inherently very hard for many people to realize the benefits of new technologies. A radical new idea is often met with skepticism, ridicule, even hostility from those who stand to lose the most from its success. Case in point, the automobile. In the late 19th century, Carl Benz and others built the first cars, contraptions that could threaten the stagecoach and railroad industries. These self-propelled vehicles, or road trains, would certainly scare horses, injure people, and damage roads. Cars, the railroad barons said, were just too dangerous. And to protect us, they used their power to pass a law in 1865. It required every automobile in England to observe a four mile per hour speed limit and to be operated by a crew of three, a driver, an engineer, and a flagman. This heroic flagman walked in front of the car to warn fellow citizens of the coming danger. The railroad tycoons, the lawmakers, the self-appointed gatekeepers used regulation to stifle innovation. But they didn't invent the flagman. He's been around for a long time. For centuries, very few could read. Books were copied by hand. The people in control, political and religious leaders, wanted to keep it that way. And they greeted Johann Gutenberg's printing press with licensing laws, publishing bans, taxes. In some parts of the world, printing was a crime punishable by death. After all, they were just protecting us from dangerous ideas. Before the printing press, there were an estimated 30,000 books in all of Europe. 50 years later, there were 10 million. As Gutenberg's invention flourished, the dark ages withered. Progress couldn't be stopped. But the flagman never stops trying. 
His masters set him loose on each of these innovations because they threatened someone's profits, someone's control. But remember, this is a story about money. What if a technological innovation allowed anyone in the world to be their own bank? To create a currency free from taxes and banking fees? The U.S. Constitution forbids citizens from printing or minting their own currency competing with or undercutting reliance on the U.S. dollar. In 1998, Bernard von Nothaus decided to test the resolve of the federal government. The Liberty Dollar was available in gold, silver, platinum, and copper. It was available in three forms, both in specie, in other words, gold and silver, in paper, as warehouse receipts, and in digital form. Obviously, the government didn't like it, they arrested me uh, and convicted me of counterfeiting fraud and conspiracy, and I'm currently awaiting 22 years sentence in federal prison. Ultimately, the feds didn't lock him up and throw away the key. Nordhaus got away with six months home arrest and probation. I was at a hackers convention in the Netherlands. There was a young hacker there who used the alias of Satoshi Nakamoto. And he talked to a friend of mine, and he identified the Liberty Dollar and me as inspiring him to create a new currency. This is actually the only recorded eyewitness account, secondhand, of someone meeting Satoshi in person. And that was in 2005. Quite extraordinary. But personally, I'm not even sure I believe it, and I'm not really that interested. I'm much more interested why Satoshi created Bitcoin anonymously. Bernard von Nothaus's arrest for creating private money may also have inspired Bitcoin's inventor to keep a lower profile, publishing the invention under an alias and vanishing. Part of me is interested to know like who Satoshi is. Maybe that's part of the mystique of the story. It's completely irrelevant to the functioning of Bitcoin because we have the, the, the code to read, uh, but it would be kind of fun to know. Who is Archimedes? Who is Euclid? We don't know. We don't know if Euclid was one person or multiple people. And you know what? It doesn't matter. Euclidean geometry works whether I know who Euclid was or not, whether Euclid was a moral and good person, or whether he was a corrupt plutocrat and a bastard. Science and mathematics have essential truth that stands alone, irrespective of its inventors and irrespective of their motives. Well, Bitcoin is a system based on mathematical truths, and these mathematical truths stand alone. We can read the source code in Bitcoin and understand it, and it will be true whether Satoshi Nakamoto is a man, a woman, a collection of individuals, a government agency, or aliens from the future. You see, it actually wouldn't have worked any other way. Think about it. If a Silicon Valley funded startup, or a government, or some professor, would have founded it. It would have never worked because remember who the early adopters of Bitcoin were? Cypherpunks, crypto anarchists, libertarians, and yeah, drug dealers too. So this anti-fragile nature actually was built in from the very start. And remember, this is also helpful because a quasi-religious movement is forming around Bitcoin, the maximalist. And that's really helpful if you have an anonymous founder with some mystique around it. Bitcoin is an open source software protocol like much of the code supporting the internet and email. Open source means anyone, everyone can use the protocol. No one person or company can control it. Every change to the software is public, open and transparent. The code was first developed by Satoshi. Then there were dozens, now hundreds, of programmers constantly collaborating to improve Bitcoin's features and security. 
So what makes Bitcoin a breakthrough? It tackles an ancient human dilemma and solves a computer science problem. Any shared information or data can be flawed, corrupted. Anything can be faked. How do we know that what we're receiving can be trusted? In our traditional mindset, it's very important to know who is behind this currency because their reputation is significant in knowing that our funds and the true wealth is actually safe. In finance, we rely on trusted third parties like banks, credit card companies, remittance services. They keep track of money as it moves from one account to another and they charge us handsomely for it. We trust that their digital ledgers of credits and debits balance. A financial system that cuts out these middlemen could be faster, cheaper, and more secure. But Bitcoin is digital. Music and movies are easily pirated, copied, stolen. How can a digital currency retain value if anyone can make a million copies? The answer is at the core of Satoshi's invention. A Bitcoin is not a file on a computer. It's an entry in the publicly distributed database called the blockchain. Just as the Medici kept a ledger of credits and debits, today's banks record each transaction as a plus and minus in their ledgers. Now we call them databases. Bank accounts are replaced by a digital wallet that you alone control. Bitcoin's ledger is the blockchain, a record of every Bitcoin in existence and every Bitcoin transaction ever made. It always balances because no Bitcoin ever leaves it. When a Bitcoin is sent from one digital wallet to another, what they are really sending is control over that part of the database. Code that is a unique key for the new owner. As the network processes transactions, it constantly synchronizes the one ledger across the global network. Each computer or Bitcoin miner has a complete and identical copy. And because the blockchain is public, it cannot be controlled by any one person or computer. Owners of the Bitcoin mining computers are rewarded with new Bitcoins for processing transactions and keeping the network secure. In other words, the Bitcoin network replaces banks and bankers. Today, the combined computing power of this global network is greater than the 500 biggest supercomputers combined, times 10,000. Hold on, hold on, hold on. That fact always fascinated me. 10,000 times the top 500 supercomputers put together. That's crazy. But today that number would be closer to 5 million. Unbelievable. Now, critics have always said, there's one thing that worries them about Bitcoin. It is controlled by China because most of the computing power is in China. Well, that used to be true, but recently China actually banned Bitcoin mining. What happened was that half of the network power, the hash power, dropped. But those miners put their hardware back to other countries, to the US, to Canada, to Kazakhstan. As a result, the Bitcoin network is even stronger, even more globally distributed than it was before. Now, why did China ban Bitcoin? Obviously, it's a risk, it's a threat to a fiat currency. We, we understand that now. But the other is the environmental debate. Sure, the Bitcoin network consumes a lot of energy, a lot of it is fossil fuels. Um, so the concern is correct. But if you look a little bit deeper into the statistics, and lazy journalists never do this, Bitcoin miners move to wherever the energy is cheapest. And that is, in most countries of the world, already sustainable energy. That's why Bitcoin is actually driving fossil fuels out and increasing sustainable energy. It's almost concern trolling from the media. It's like, we are very concerned about the energy impact of Bitcoin. Oh, you should really check out the energy impact of capitalism. Or, even better, the energy impact of war. Do you know who the largest consumer of energy in the United States is? The military, right? And the largest consumer of oil, also. And the biggest polluter in the world is the military. So, pardon me if I don't take that concern so seriously. Central banks create money to boost the economy and try to pull it back out before inflation heats up. 
But no one knows how much magic money global banks are creating to boost their profits with questionable loans. Bitcoin is completely the opposite. It's totally transparent. You know exactly how many exist. The computer code behind Bitcoin has a built-in brake pedal, cutting the creation of Bitcoins in half every four years. This ensures a transparent, controlled scarcity and ultimately limits the total number of Bitcoins to 21 million. No lobbyist, no politician, no banker can create more or change the mathematical rules dictating their creation. Advancing accountability, uh, and that's one of the things I think is most exciting about Bitcoin and the technology behind it, is not so much that it will supplant the dollar or that it will supplant government itself, but that all of a sudden there's a competitor to government and that government itself now needs to look over its shoulder more than it did. In 2014, the believers of Bitcoin thought and dreamed about replacing the dollar. But clearly that hasn't happened, and in my view, it will never happen. Just like the internet gave us tweets and blogs and e-books, but it didn't replace books or bookstores. Remember, a commodity money is relatively scarce, easily recognizable, can be cut into smaller pieces. You can substitute one piece for another of equal value, and you can carry it around without too much trouble. Let's talk about these five characteristics one more time to drive the point home, right? So Bitcoin clearly is scarce. In fact, some would argue it's the scarcest financial asset in the world, right? The inflation rate, the Bitcoin mining has, has slowed down, so it gets scarcer and scarcer every four years. It is divisible. We can divide it by 100 million times. It's transportable. I can send it to anyone on the planet. Um, doesn't matter which country you're in. The verifiability is interesting. I can verify my Bitcoin immediately in a split second, but a fake dollar bill? A fake gold coin? I'm not so sure I could spot that. Back to you, John. This digital currency has the five key characteristics of money. But is it a store of value? Is it stable or will it diminish over time, like a commodity rendered useless or a crop that fails? So this was really the big question of the first seven, eight years of Bitcoin. Can it be a store of value? Bitcoin has been the best performing financial asset of the last decade, no doubt about it. But it has been volatile, let's be honest. So how I like to think about it is short-term versus long-term volatility, right? Over the long run, fiat currencies lose value by inflation every couple of years. You lose, you lose, you lose. We've seen the statistics. Bitcoin, however, increases in value over the long run. But on the short term, well, it can lose 10%, maybe even 50% over a short period of time. You have to be prepared for that. You could not miss the point more effectively than by thinking of Bitcoin as a currency and payment network that will make shopping easier for the first world. Bitcoin is about everything else, everywhere else. There are 2.5 billion people without a bank account. With Bitcoin, a mobile phone with an internet connection is now a bank with access to the global marketplace. What happens when Bitcoin services and infrastructure and Bitcoin wallets and payment processes start going into these countries? These people will be able to gain benefits from trade where they could not previously. These people will be able to send money home, uh, international remittance, which is one of the major pain points of the current financial system. Seven years later, Stefan has become a major voice as a Bitcoin-only educator and podcaster. So good to see you after so many years. Um, so um, just reflecting back on what you said, um, uh, told us uh, in 2014-15, um, uh, what's your quick take on that one? Well, I think, to be honest, I came out pretty well from that, right? Because I was just basically saying it's going to enable more and more people to transact around the world where currently they're not able to. Now, could we have known back then that the message of day-to-day -day transactions all happening on chain that didn't really pan out that said lightning network now has become uh, has grown and come to a level now where it can be used for day-to-day -day commerce i probably could not have foreseen how quickly nation state adoption would have happened obviously el salvador being the big example there of a country adopting bitcoin as legal tender which is obviously a huge step so we were thinking of building Bitcoin City. 
This small Central American country has even announced a new form of government bond. It will hold half of the funds in bitcoins and use the other half to build infrastructure. They have also started to mine bitcoins with clean geothermal energy from an actual volcano. People can potentially invest into El Salvador and be funding the Bitcoin City project. The interesting part is it has, I believe it's a 6.25% coupon. And on top of that, there will be a Bitcoin dividend also. We actually built this world that we live in over the last two or three hundred years. We've made some mistakes. We've learnt to make things better. The idea that there's some magic key, that if you just sort of stop doing a few things, that there'll be this perfect order that will settle, is a very childish, ideological delusion, in my opinion. But that is not to say that Bitcoin isn't an exciting thing. It's a terrifically exciting thing. But we have to try and engage with it with working minds, not with magical thinking. People are suggesting that it's going to be another world currency, rivaling the dollar or the euro or the yen. I think that's not going to happen. I prefer to trust the banks or the central government compared to the Bitcoin is because someone's accountable. Whereas with the Bitcoin, it's completely deregulated. There's no central control. There's no one held accountable. It is a free float. It's purely demand and supply driven. Mr. What? Williams? So clearly this is not a currency. Currencies don't behave like this. But what this is, is a high risk speculative commodity. So for the entrepreneurs, the bankers, the governments, and everyone else studying and watching Bitcoin, all I have to say is that there will probably be a lot of volatility and an upward trajectory, and to buckle up. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> so, uh, what's your first <laughs> reaction to this? Oh my god, I feel like I look like a child. Um, it's been uh, seven years, I think, since I said that. Um, we actually just celebrated our 10th year anniversary. So for any company that's a really big milestone in the cryptocurrency world, uh, that makes us uh, the OGs and uh, kind of an original firm. Um, so we have a lot of things to celebrate. So not only have we survived and helped build this economy up, um, but the things I'm most proud of is that our users have performed over a trillion dollars worth of on-chain transactions. We've had over 80 million people test and use blockchain.com wallets on iOS, Android, and web, and we really built out a robust business. We've also built out a full institutional offering though. So now we do custody, we do lending, we have a venture fund, and we're also working with protocol projects to do all kinds of new exciting things like get distribution into the retail base and much more. So uh, we're starting to look a little bit more ironically like uh, a JP Morgan in some ways, um, but with the intent of building out a crypto services firm for the next 10 years. And the digitization of financial services has blended with crypto and um, now it is going to run rampant through all these institutions. Um, and without a doubt, not only are they gonna start offering crypto uh, you know, services to all their clients, um, but every single financial service provider will have to have a crypto offering or a crypto um, service within the next decade. Bitcoiners all over the world have kickstarted a cultural movement and the most hardcore supporters are the so-called maximalists. On social media, you've probably seen their laser eyes, hodl and stacking sets memes. Sets stands for satoshis or tiny fractions of Bitcoin. It's more about this idea of reflecting and realizing that Bitcoin is going to be the money of the world. The general idea is you want to be accumulating sats, whether you're mining the coins, earning them or buying them, because we see this like we're playing out this game of hyper Bitcoinization. And so in 10 or 15 years or we don't know when the music, the music is going to stop. And when the music stops, you want to be holding a chair. I'm fascinated by the whole um, Bitcoin maximalism, that like cultural movement, if you will. So the origin of the term Bitcoin maximalist was actually an epithet. It was an insult, a put down term by Vitalik. Essentially, he was trying to get interest, drum up interest into his altcoin. For me, the real competition for Bitcoin is not against altcoins. It's actually against gold and the US dollar. The biggest financial mistake you can make right now is to own an amount of Bitcoin 
that you cannot afford to lose because it's super risky and you may lose it. The second biggest financial mistake you can make is not to own any because you put 1% of your net worth in Bitcoin. Most people can afford to lose 1% of their net worth. And if I am right, it's going to be more than 100% of your net worth. So with a non-material exposure, you change your life. Now, what you would spend with your, on a romantic weekend with your wife, say, sorry, we're not going to do that this weekend. I'm going to just buy Bitcoin, consider it spent, it disappeared, check in seven years. I either gave you bad advice and cost you a weekend, or I want a grandkid called Juancito. <laughs> The digital age has fundamentally changed the world. We have embraced digitized music, film, medical records, communications, the internet. The free exchange of information and currency can fuel revolutions, help in a disaster. But our money is shackled to the 20th century, manipulated by governments and banks. The champions of Bitcoin ask us to imagine payments without a middleman, investments without a broker, loans without a bank, insurance without an underwriter, charity without a trustee, escrow without an agent, betting without a bookie, record keeping without an accountant, global, secure, nearly instant and free. Is it fantasy or the future of money and commerce? We started this journey in the moon capsule. Will Bitcoin continue to go to the moon? My personal theory is that no one will compete against Bitcoin as a store of value. I think we are seeing the beginning of the end of fiat money. We are also seeing the birth of digital gold. We are seeing the rise of Bitcoin. That's my prediction, but you might disagree. Let's see and speak in seven years.